It's the early 1990s, and the world's most powerful drug lord, who also happens to be one of the world's wealthiest individuals, is relaxing in his jacuzzi. Tons of his cocaine are snorted and shipped all over the world. Looking out a window, he notices the usual twilight fog encircling his mountain castle. He's safe and sound, living the high life. Despite this, he is technically incarcerated. Pablo Escobar, often known as the King of Coke or El Patron to his comrades, doesn't require much of an introduction. He amassed a wealth of up to $30 billion, making him the world's richest criminal. One of the reasons many of you will be familiar with this man's life story is that in death, he made a lot of money for Netflix. He had already amassed over $3 million by the mid-1970s, while Americans were queuing in toilet stalls. His operations expanded. He created new smuggling routes and purchased more planes. And the United States was overwhelmed with cocaine in the 1980s. Wall Street brokers couldn't get through the day without a straightener, and it wouldn't be long before the drug entered many, many American neighborhoods. Pablo is now a billionaire. He's regarded as a Robin Hood figure by the disadvantaged people he assists in Colombia, and there aren't many officials he doesn't know. Then, in 1990, a guy named Luis Carlos Gallen entered the Colombian political scene, determined to win the presidential race. He wants to clean things up and get rid of corruption, and he, of course, despises Escobar's Medellin cartel. The United States wanted Escobar extradited to face the music in the United States, and Gallen agreed. This was awful news for Pablo, and it wasn't long before Gallen was murdered. One of the cartel's hitmen, John Jero Velasqueza, also known as Popeye, has since stated that Pablo was responsible. We should also keep in mind that the cartel still had many paid allies in politics and the military, and Gallen as president would have put a hole in their under-the-table income. The problem was that Escobar and his cartel had gotten out of hand. There had been far too much bloodshed on the streets, and putting Gallen out was viewed as wielding far too much authority. The United States exerted considerable pressure as well. A new administration took power, and under the Colombian Constitution of 1991, extradition of Colombians to the United States was prohibited. Escobar very certainly ghostwrote this section of the Constitution. Escobar cut a bargain with the Colombian authorities after realizing he couldn't be extradited to the United States for a life sentence in an isolated cell. He surrendered and promised to serve five years in prison. But there was a catch. He would create the prison himself and be guarded by individuals he chose. This could only happen after handshakes with some corrupt Colombian government officials. Escobar's vision did not include four walls, a cement bed, and a steel basin. In fact, it was exactly the contrary. He envisioned his captivity to be more akin to an extravagant palace, complete with all modern luxuries. This is why it's been dubbed Hotel Escobar or Club Medellin. At the same time, his communications with the outside world were not to be hampered by his imprisonment. So in a sense, all that had happened was that he was being guarded against his adversaries rather than being locked up. Escobar was well aware that many people wanted him dead, so he chose a mountaintop position for his hotel prison. After a scouting trip with his brother, he decided on this location. He could see anyone approaching from there, and the location featured telescopes for long-distance surveillance. It wasn't an easy area to get to, and any adversaries seeking to find him would have had a difficult time navigating the steep terrain. The location was also fogged in for much of the day, making an air assault extremely difficult. Suffice to say, the prison was fortified and included a big facility containing guns and ammunition. Escobar's hotel might not have appeared to be particularly magnificent from the outside. After all, he needed to maintain the idea that he was being imprisoned. High walls and barbed wire fences surrounding it. Things were different after you got through those barriers, though. Escobar was a keen soccer lover. Therefore, he had a soccer field where he and his guys could kick about. It was also a good pitch, and Escobar even invited the Colombian national team to play there at one point, according to Hitman, Popeye. 22 players from the 1991 national team did make the trip up the mountain on one occasion, despite the fact that they needed several off-road vehicles to get there. They began with a lunch fit for kings, and then Escobar put on his nicest cleats and grabbed a ball. Escobar, who was slightly overweight, wasn't on the same level as those men, but they put up with him. He wasn't the type of guy a football player would want to slide tackle. Prison guards brought refreshments from the sidelines, and after the game, the same guards served drinks to Escobar and the other players while they danced in the disco. The interior of the house had to be lavish enough 
so that he could host parties and have people stay in rooms suited for a five-star hotel. The kitchen was vast, resembling that of a huge hotel, with all modern appliances. Escobar was celebrating his 42nd birthday up there, and he was in a good mood. He arranged for an expensive meal to be prepared by chefs from some of Medellin's finest restaurants. Escobar enjoyed his cuisine, especially after a few drinks and a puff at his favorite cannabis. His family and several of his closest friends were invited to his party. That evening supper included turkey, smoked salmon, smoked trout, and caviar. Some of the rooms were designated as party rooms, where guests could play billiards or watch sports on the largest TV screens available at the time. There was a wider area where you could dance beneath disco lights all night. The dance floor included a rotating disc in the center, allowing men to dance around the models Escobar invited up to his hotel in the sky on occasion. He would invite escorts to his castle when models were not accessible. They'd sneak up the mountain in military trucks, only to be apprehended the next day. Money, women, and groceries were all discreetly transported up there, usually when the fog was thick. Millions of dollars were spent climbing and descending that mountain. He installed a jacuzzi and sauna for relaxation, as well as a pool, gym, and waterfall. Unfortunately, the exotic animals he once kept for his own zoo did not make it up the mountain. He did, however, manage to construct a life-size dollhouse for his daughter's visits. During his time there, it is estimated that he received roughly 300 visits from guests, but the celebration would soon come to an end. The building hadn't even been finished when word spread that Escobar had ordered the assassination of two cartel members. Some claimed they were tortured first, while others claimed they were just shot and buried behind the prison walls. Escobar had to start employing carrier pigeons because the CIA was listening in on his phone calls. If they were ever apprehended, a small sticker on their legs would read, Pablo Escobar, Maximum Security Prison, and Vigado. After a little more than a year, the Colombian government decided it was time to put him to a regular prison, which Escobar did not like. Some government factions were outraged when they learned about his lavish lifestyle and his mansion. According to the agreement, they couldn't relocate Escobar but they might sentence him to a cell in the same facility. Escobar was opposed to remaining in the aerial cell, and the country's severely corrupt Bureau of Prisons was clearly incapable of constructing genuine cells. Even private contractors were afraid to go up there, with one declaring, we're not going to build a cage with the line already inside. Escobar had to be carried down the mountain. The Colombian National Army's 4th Brigade surrounded La Cathedral's complex in July 1992. They were accompanied by the country's vice minister of justice. The soldiers had rifles aimed at the location, and according to at least one book, when Escobar ordered the men to lower their firearms, they did so. But when Escobar kidnapped the minister, all hell broke loose. One person was murdered and several more were injured. It's unclear how he just walked out of there, but he seemed to effortlessly go by many armed guys who'd been trained by the United States Delta Force. And with that being said, it's time to end our video. What's your take on Pablo Escobar's five-star prison? Let us know in the comments. Like this video and make sure to subscribe to the channel for more amazing videos like this. We'll see you in the next video.